Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah's words were spoken in a day of great spiritual darkness. Those words pierced the darkness on the night Jesus was born. Today, those same words still pierce the darkness for every soul who would believe. Into our sorrow, into our pain, into our confusion, into our loneliness. Unto us a child is born. Amen. It's good to know we have a Savior born unto us. Amen? Man, you know, the, the stunning glory of God is not just that he is holy and righteous. That alone would be enough. That alone is enough for the angels in heaven for all eternity to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. It's not just that that's his greatest glory. It's not just the fact that he is merciful, compassionate, and sees those who are weary and weak and is drawn to them. That is what causes us for all eternity to say worthy, worthy, worthy. Amen? But the stunning glory that caught the disciples in a place that they weren't expecting and the glory that really is greater than both of those things is that he is both of those things at the same time. He is fully righteous, fully holy, all truth, full of justice, and in all of that, at the exact same time, he is also merciful, compassionate, and full of grace for those who are broken and weary and humble. That is the glory of our God. Amen? That he would be both of those for us. You see glimpses of this throughout the scripture, but I love Psalm 8510. It says, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. There is no separation between these two in God. He is fully righteous and he fully desires peace with us as well. So when we come to this time of year, we come to the verse or verses that we're using in this series, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We are typically, because of the time in which we've grown up, we typically associate that with sweet memories. We associate that with Mary and Joseph and this idyllic setting like all of our manger scenes and it's quiet and it's beautiful and it's peaceful. But when Isaiah wrote those words hundreds of years before, he didn't look ahead and see the sweet idyllic situation that we saw or see. He saw instead one who would come who would bring with him the power to lead not just the people of God, but in all eternity, and he would be this powerful, reigning, justice-filled, loving, compassionate God who would be the deliverer for his people. He didn't see just this sweet scene. He saw a majestic, powerful, gritty, real-to-life scene that said, here is one who's going to come, and he will grow up, and he will deliver those who have been punished by sin and are under justice and in need of a savior. That is what he meant when he said unto us, a child is born, unto us a son is given. It's a little bit different story than what we associate with. Isaiah wrote those words in chapter nine. In fact, if you want to go ahead and turn there today, Isaiah chapter nine, verse six is where we're going to be. Isaiah wrote those words in a time of war in their own nation, a time when there was a lack of governmental leadership and strength. A time when there was great oppression for the weak, 
a time when there was cultural chaos in the land, a time when sin was rampant, and a time when the nation was under the disciplined hand of God. God was showing them, here's what it looks like when you turn away from me, and they were facing all of the suffering that went with that. They were being attacked from other lands. They were under oppression, threat of slavery. And Isaiah wrote with words of hope at a time when the people so desperately needed a word. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God was saying through Isaiah, it will not always be this way. The days will not always be dark. You will not always be in pain. There will not always be injustice. There will not always be war. There will not always be a resistance to following God. There will be a gift that will come from heaven. He will be heaven's child. He will have in him the DNA of God himself. And he will rule and he will reign and there will be a new government upon the earth and he will sit on the throne over it all. There was a new day coming. And God gave the people in that day hope. And it's really essential that we live with hope. And there's nothing worse than getting to that moment where it seems like every door is shut. Where it seems like around every corner is something sinister where it seems there's not enough for all that you face and there's nothing good in the future. That's a desperate situation. And God shows Isaiah, oh, there's coming a day and you need to be filled with hope. And that same hope is available for us today. Wherever you live today, whatever you're in the midst of today, whatever you're walking through, whatever is going on in your home, whatever is happening in your family, whatever is happening on the job, in your finances, in your health, whatever it is, there is hope in Jesus Christ. He offers us that hope when we are at our lowest, when we are in the darkness. There's coming a day when Jesus will reign. There's coming a day in the future when all wrongs will be righted. There's coming a day when he actually will reign on planet Earth. It seems to be a topic not talked about as much today in churches, in times stuff. But Isaiah goes right to it here. He says, oh, there's coming a day, all right. There's coming a day when on planet Earth, Jesus will be on the throne and he will reign. You should have hope. You should be encouraged. That throne will be here. And in that day, there'll be no more threat against his kingdom. There'll be no more wondering when he will come, for he will be here. There'll be no need for light in that day, for Jesus will be the light. There'll be no need for any more tears because he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more having to actually have faith because what we believe now by faith will be sight. Amen? That day is coming, and we live with that peace. So when Isaiah writes, he gives these descriptions of what Jesus will be like, not just now, but in that day. Because he says, he'll reign, the government of all eternity will be on his shoulders, and there'll be some things that will be true about him. He will be, in that day, a wonderful counselor. We saw that last week. But today I want us to do a little bit of a deep dive on the next description that Isaiah gives of Jesus as king. He calls him the mighty God. 
mighty God. Again, we look at this and we think of all the references that we have for who Jesus has been to us and is to us. But when Isaiah writes these words, when Isaiah talks about the mighty God, he has a little bit different picture than we might associate with someone who comes over to see a brand new baby. When a baby is born in the house, everyone comes over and, oh, he's just so sweet, just so beautiful, he's so tiny. And Isaiah says, yeah, well, see, when I look ahead and I see that a child is born and a son has been given to us, I see him as the mighty God. And this word here for mighty God, the word for mighty, is a word that means a warrior, a word that means a conquering soldier, one who comes, who brings vengeance against his enemies and he wins and he wins handily he wins mightily he is powerful and he is the ruling reigning God and Isaiah looks down and sees this baby in in future and he says I see this as the mighty God it's interesting the word used here in the Old Testament in Hebrew it's El Gibor it's a word that means conquering soldier It was used in other references in the Old Testament. It was used in Genesis to describe uh, a mighty man whose name was Nimrod. And he was a mighty soldier. In fact, in Genesis 10, 9, it says that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was a man who was valiant, who was powerful, who was strong, who could wield his sword. We see it also used to describe the men that served David, the king. He had an elite group of forces that served him. The Bible refers to them as David's mighty men, and the term that it used to describe them is the same word used here. In fact, in 2 Samuel 23, 8, it gives a list of all of those mighty men, and it starts and says the chief among them was the captains, and it gives his name, a little bit of his background, and it says he was this chief. He was the guy who was the elite of the elite forces because it says he had killed 800 men at one time. That would put you in the elite of the elite forces group. And this word used here is the same word used to describe God in this situation. It's the same word used to describe Jesus in this verse that he will be that kind of warrior, champion, valiant, conquering, soldier, king. Now, that's a little unusual if you're saying that about a baby, but this is what Isaiah says about him. And the Old Testament has other references where it speaks of God in this way. Let me show you a couple of these. So, for example, in Deuteronomy, in the early parts of the New Testament, uh, we read here, it says, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God mighty, there's that word, Gabor, used here, and awesome. If you're reading in the King James today, it says terrible here in this verse. Now, we use that in a different frame of reference today, but it's this word that means to be, to be feared, to be recognized for his power and strength. He's the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. And it goes on to describe in this passage why he is this mighty God. It says in the next verse that he administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. You see, one of the things that makes God this justice-seeking, conquering, soldier, valiant, warrior is that he despises injustice. He hates to see the weak taken advantage of. He hates to see the poor being abused. He hates to see the weak being sold into slavery. And that stuff just gets all over God. And it calls him to action. That's why it says here, he administers justice for those who are fatherless and the widow, those who cannot defend themselves. And he loves the stranger, the one that's on the outside, the one who's been rejected. And he loves those who have nothing because he wants to provide for them. God is moved by those who were caught in injustice and in slavery, in caught in moments they cannot defend themselves and cannot get out of. God's attention is drawn to them and he seeks justice for them. This is the El Gabor, the mighty God. He is drawn to the powerless. He's drawn to the weak and that is why he was drawn to us. Amen? Jeremiah also talks about this mighty God. 
In Jeremiah 32, it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your power and your outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And he says in the next verse, you show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers and the bosom of their children after them. This mighty God, this great God who is the one who is valiant, who is the soldier, he shows loving kindness to thousands and repays the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children and after them. So sometimes Christians read this verse and they get all a little nervous right? Because you read this whole thing here about repaying into the children, their father's sins, all that stuff, right? And Christians, you look at that and think, oh my goodness, my children and my grandchildren are going to pay so dearly for all my sins. God's going to pour it out on them, right? Anybody get a little nervous about that kind of stuff when you read this stuff in the Bible? Y'all out there? Yeah. So here's the deal. I get reading it that way but I want you to read it in its proper context and I want you to read it according to truth. Look at it again. God, you are the mighty God. You show loving kindness to thousands. So here, Jeremiah is writing to God's people and saying, if you are God's people, you have nothing to fear. He keeps his covenant and he will never turn his back on his people. He will always be with them and before them. He will not turn and judge his people because they are his people. He shows covenant kindness to thousands, to all of those who believe in him. But he will repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children and after them for those who do not follow him, for those who are outside of of him, for those who rail against him, for those who take advantage of his own people, for those who persecute, for those who punish, for those who seek to enslave God's people. Oh, you better watch out because this mighty God, this El Gibor is drawn to those who are caught in injustice. He's drawn to his own people. He'll show loving kindness to them, but boy, you better not mess with his people because he'll come after you and he'll show his judgment into them and the future generations if need be because God always takes care of his people. Amen? Amen? There's so many implications to this. We know from the New Testament that for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. There is no more judgment. You and I, if you are in Christ, you are not awaiting another day where your sins will be held against you and you'll be punished at some courtroom in heaven. Your sins were put on Jesus Christ. He paid for them in totality. You will never have to pay for your sins in eternity. Amen? That's the good news. We make one other application of this while we're here, since we're on the topic of end times. When we talk about the great tribulation, when God pours out his wrath upon the earth, guess who will not be here when that happens? The church. Because God will not pour out judgment upon his people. He only pours out judgment on those who resist him. He shows covenant kindness to his own. Amen? It's kind of the deal like you if you had children and you're in the front yard and someone came up and started messing with your children. You'd be out that front door. Hello? You would be executing justice if necessary in that moment to protect your own. Hello? The people down the street, you might go and care for them as well. You probably would. But when it's your own, something different is happening inside here. Hello? And this is exactly what happens for God. He says, you can do some stuff out here and you will pay for it. You start messing with my people and you will really pay for it. I'm coming after you. And this is our God, this El Gabor, because the next verse tells us this is the great, the mighty God whose name is the Lord of hosts. Don't mess with him. He protects his own and he comes after those who take advantage of his own. Amen? So when Isaiah looks down through time, he says this, this is this child, this child is the El Gabor, the mighty God, the justice-seeking warrior, the valiant champion 
who will defend the fatherless and stand for the weak and all those who have been under the enslavement of the evil one and sin itself. So I want us to look today at what it means that Jesus is the mighty God. When Jesus was here on planet Earth, he was the mighty God. In fact, he began his ministry with these words in Luke 4, 18. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Listen to who? To the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed. Those were Jesus' words. He, his inaugural day of ministry began with those words. He said, let me tell you who I have my eyes set on. The poor, the blind, the oppressed, the captives. This is who I have come for. I'm drawn to those. And we know from the story of Jesus, he was drawn to the woman who was set up and caught in the very act of adultery and used by the Pharisees to try to trick Jesus. He was drawn to her. He was drawn to a father whose son was without hope. He was drawn to a young girl who had died and her family. He was drawn to a man who was possessed by demons. He was drawn to those who had been oppressed by the Pharisees, whom they had taken God's law and used it as a whip against people. Jesus was drawn to them. Jesus was drawn to the moment in the temple when his place was being used to sell sacrifices at outrageous prices to take advantage of people. Jesus is always drawn to the moment where there is injustice happening and it awakens in him the El Gabor, the mighty righteous warrior. So when God looked down through eternity and saw us, he saw us separated from God. He saw us struggling. He saw us caught in our sin. He saw us enslaved by the accusations of the enemy. He saw us filled with anxiety. He saw us overwhelmed with depression. He saw us overcome with fear. He saw us broken and not knowing what to do. And as a result of all of that, this moved him to action. He didn't just say, oh, those poor folks. My heart just breaks for them. It did. But Jesus is full of grace and he is full of truth. And out of that, he moved. Jesus, therefore, was the one who took our punishment. Jesus, because of this, suffered in silence for a crime he did not commit. Because of this, Jesus faced physical torture, whip, and crucifixion for you and me because we were the ones being taken advantage of. Jesus is the one who faced hordes of demons on the cross, who cursed him, who accused him. Jesus was the one who stared death in the face and Jesus is the one who took our punishment so that we could be free from being slaves, so that we could be free from hiding away, so that we could stop living as the fatherless and the poor and the downtrodden and the abused, but so that we could be brought into his family and we could know that he is the mighty God. This is what Jesus was when he was here. But Jesus not only was while he was here, he became a conquering hero because not only did he stare death in the face, not only did he lay down his life to pay for our sin, he rose valiantly on the third day. He became the conqueror over death and hell and the grave. He became the one who was the champion for us that we can look to and that there's hope and life in him. Amen? But the Bible looks forward also. We have the joy and privilege today of having something Isaiah didn't have. 
we have the book of Revelation today. We get to look further down the road. Isaiah looked down the road to see the birth of Jesus. Isaiah looked all the way and even saw glimpses of this mighty God and this everlasting Father and this Prince of Peace. But the book of Revelation shows us something about who Jesus will be. Jesus as the mighty God in eternity. And I know the book of Revelation is one of those very complex, uh, hard to understand books sometimes. But the passage I'm going to read to you today is not complex. It's not hard to understand. It's very clear. Revelation 19, I want to read to you, starting in verse 11. John is getting a picture, kind of like Isaiah is, of a time in eternity. When Jesus is on the throne. And Jesus, once again, is moved to action. And Revelation 19 says this in verse 11. Now, I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. I think we already know this is Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. I thought Jesus was a meek and mild, passive savior. Oh, he is. And he was a servant when he came the first time. But when he comes again... He will not be the meek and mild servant. He'll come as the conquering, ruling, El Gibor, mighty God king. Amen? Verse 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Oh, this is Jesus. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Oh, this is the champion assembling for battle. He says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Oh, this is Jesus coming back at the time of the tribulation, at the end of that time. He's coming back to bring justice upon the earth. And it says, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is that coming king. This is our Jesus. And so whatever injustice is happening, this king will come to set things right. You know, his robe here dipped in blood. You might think, oh, I'm sure that's a reference to his own own blood poured out. No. This is a a reference, I believe, to those who have been martyred to those whose lives have been taken for their belief in Jesus Christ and the bottom of his robe is dipped in their blood and boy, he is moved to action. You have touched my people and I'm coming and I'm coming quickly and I'm coming with my sword and I'm coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is all intended to give us as God's people great hope. For there is nothing that he does not see and does not keep an account of and will bring justice for. Amen? It's intended to give us hope, but boy, it is intended to strike fear in anyone who is not a child of God. It should strike a little bit of terror in anyone because our God is full of holiness, righteousness, and truth. He is the God who is full of grace and mercy. So while there's still time, it's time to call upon this mercy and grace because there'll be a day when he will come back in full truth and justice. So Jesus was the mighty God here on earth. He will be the mighty God in that day on planet earth. But I want us to think about today that Jesus is the mighty God now. 
you might look at your circumstances and say, well, I don't see that much justice, retribution, and vengeance being poured out right now. I still see injustice. I still see things happening. I still see prayers unanswered. I still see a lack of resolve. I still see the righteous suffering. I get it. Like every other saint of the ages, there were days when they cried out to the Lord and waited for the king to move. But Zephaniah 3.17, I believe, gives us hope. I want us to zero in on this. Zephaniah, again, writes from the Old Testament, but he looks ahead and sees the mighty God, this El Gabor, this champion, valiant soldier God who was the mighty God in Jesus, will be the mighty God in Jesus, but is the mighty God for us in Jesus today. So, as we look at this verse today, we begin with verse 17, the first part of it. He says this. He says, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. Zephaniah uses that word, the first part of this verse here, the mighty one. Let me go ahead and get these on screen. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. You see, that's what happens when all of a sudden we get to a moment and things are not happening the way we thought they were going to. And all of a sudden injustice is happening all around us. We need to be reminded that the Lord your God in your midst, he's with you. He has not left you. He's not forsaken you. Remember, he is in your midst. He is present with you. He is in us today, and we are in him today. And he is the mighty God, and he will save. It might not happen in your time frame. It might not happen in the way you thought, but God is always doing things differently than the way we thought. And he will save in the men's breakfast, we are looking in James chapter 5, and we came across this very same theme this past week. James, in chapter 5, is writing to two groups. He's writing to the poor believers who are being oppressed by the rich in their day. And they have become refugees in their own land, and they're crying out to God. They're being cheated. They're not getting what they deserve for their income when they work. And James writes to give them hope. But James writes with a word of warning to those who are taking advantage of them. And James says this in verse 4 of chapter 5. He says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Anytime you see the phrase, the Lord of hosts, it's a reference to the vengeance-seeking, justice-filled God. And James was saying, oh, you cheaters, those of you who defraud, those of you who take advantage of others, the cries of the weak have come to me and have awakened in me the Lord of hosts, and now I will come and I will act. God is the mighty God, and he is in our midst, and he will save. You might look at your circumstances today. You might look at news clippings today. You might read headlines on the internet today and think, it's over, it's done, it's too late. God has gone silent on us. Look. Just because it doesn't happen in the way you think and I think doesn't mean it won't happen. God is storing up what he needs to store up for the day to rightly and righteously do what he has promised he will always do. Save his people. Amen? And Zephaniah says, the Lord your God in your midst, he's the mighty one who will save. Psalm 37 says, I've been young and now I'm old and yet I've Never seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. God always cares for his people. He is the mighty one in our midst. But Zephaniah goes on the next part of the verse and he says something stunning. He says, he will rejoice over you with gladness. Wait a minute. I thought we were talking about the warrior God. 
I thought we were talking about this vengeance-seeking, justice-filled God who's in his valiant armor and got his sword and his battle, and here he is. Now you're telling me he's rejoicing over me with gladness. Yes, this is El Gibor. This is Jesus, who if you are part of his family, he rejoices over you. He doesn't look at you and think, you are such a mess. You pitiful excuse of a follower of mine. No, our God has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, has seated us with him in heavenly places, and when he looks at your life now, I don't care what you're in, what you've done, where you are, he rejoices over you with gladness because you are his child. Don't let anyone, any voice, anything tell you anything different. He rejoices over you with a sword in his hand to fight off the enemy and an arm around your heart. He holds you tight and rejoices over you like a father over his own child. Amen. This is our God. I think we're getting a bigger picture now all of a sudden of what it means that Jesus would be the mighty God. Oh, he rejoices over us, and he does so with gladness. It's not because he's forced to, because he feels guilty if he doesn't, because it's the right thing to do. No, he absolutely celebrates and takes pleasure and delight in you because you belong to him. He gave his son for you. Why would we believe any other voice that would seek to tell us that he does not delight in us. That's only the voice of the enemy. That's only the voice of our own flesh. That's only the voice of a world who refuses to bow its knee to this one who loves so deeply. He rejoices over you. Oh, but Zephaniah is not through. It says he will quiet you with his love. Wait, the El Gibor, the mighty God? I thought that would be something more like the tender, compassionate hands of God. No, this is the mighty God, the soldier God, the warrior God. He will quiet you with his love. In those moments where you want to panic, where you want to become so worry-filled, when you want to just lash out because you don't know what's going to happen next, he says, my child... You are my child. I have you. I've got my sword. I'm here to quiet you. Not with a finger of accusation. Now you hush down and stop all that right this minute. That's not what it says. It doesn't say he will quiet you with his pointy finger and angry voice. It says, no, he will quiet you with his love. He'll draw you in close. He'll remind you of who you are. He'll remind you of what he's done for you. He'll remind you that he'll always be with you. He'll remind you that he is here to fight for you. He's here to remind you that there is no weapon formed against you that will prosper. It's not because you're so strong, but because I'm so strong, he would say. This is our God. This is Jesus. He quiets us in our moments of anxiety. He quiets us in our moments of stress. He quiets us when you think there's so much that you have to do. He says, rest, my child, in what I have done. Stop fretting about what you think you must do. Rest and be quieted by my love for you. But Zephaniah is not finished still. In perhaps the most stunning part of verse 17, it says, He will rejoice over you with singing. A valiant warrior with his armor and his sword holding us and singing. Singing songs of peace to you holding you, reassuring you. The words here are stunning. 
the word for rejoice. It's not just the word for be happy. It's the word that in the Old Testament means to spin around as if you were dancing. It's the powerful picture of a father and a child. It's the picture that we get to see here near Valentine's Day when we have our daddy-daughter dance here and we play some moving songs and we encourage dads to hold their daughter close and they dance and they spin around in this very room in this very spot sharing a moment of encouragement, hope, and love. So what this daughter knows, your father loves you. You are my treasure and you are my delight. Here, Zephaniah says, the El Gibor, the mighty God, the strong, powerful, majestic God who fights off his enemies, who conquers and wins, he holds you close and he rejoices. He dances with you and sings songs of comfort right to your heart. You have nothing to fear. You have no need to be stressed because the El Gabor is here, the mighty God. And this is who Isaiah saw. He saw Jesus, the baby, and he saw him as the one who would be this mighty God, who would go to war against Satan and his forces, against death, against the grave, against hell, against all guilt, against all anxiety, against all fear, against all disease, and he would conquer valiantly. And so today, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you have no need to stress, to fear, to be depressed, to explain yourself, to justify yourself, to seek revenge on all those who have hurt you, You have no need to panic. You have no need to try to fix it all yourself. The mighty God is here. Now, we got to see this lived out this week behind the scenes here at our church. I want to tell you two stories of how we saw Jesus be the valiant warrior mighty God to his people. One was a single mom in great financial need with no certainty of what was going to happen next in her life. But one who has sought the Lord, prayed, trusted him, sought counsel, and has been willing to do what has been asked of her to walk in faithfulness at this time in her life. And God heard her prayer and this past week provided for her a car in a miraculous way that she could not provide for herself. Amen? Uh, That's such a beautiful way of God saying to her, I am your mighty God. Though you might want to fear and panic and be filled with all kind of anxious thoughts, I am here. I am your mighty God. But we also saw it this week on, uh, it began Wednesday, one of our members uh, began to have symptoms of having a stroke. And uh, his his name is Dave Wasick. I don't know if you've met David. He, his wife called the ambulance, took him to the hospital, and they confirmed, yes, uh, he was having mild symptoms at the time. But while he was at, at that hospital, he began to have another stroke. And they said, we're going to have to take you downtown to Baylor. So they, they get him downtown, and pretty soon they say, we're going to have to have surgery. And this is all happening in one day. And so family begins to gather. His wife is just, you know, as you would 
be upset in that moment. Um, and so they begin preparing it for surge because they say, we have to go in and remove this blood clot in your brain. So they prepare him for surgery. It's in the evening. He's got a team of warrior friends who are praying there at the hospital. And they're calling out to the Lord, asking for a miracle. They take him into the operating room. The surgeon begins a procedure. And as they begin, they begin to look one more time for this blood clot. And as they look, the blood clot is gone. There is no blood clot. Amen. The mighty God showed up in that space in that moment. The next day, um, he's in his room, got to go see him, talk with him. He is so moved because he knew his friends and family were praying. But he told me, he said, I was praying as I went into that room, God, do the miraculous here that it would bring glory to you. And he said, he heard my prayer. And he said, when they told me that in the operating room, he said, he was still conscious. He said, I asked them, do you all believe in God here? Because he just did a miracle. And so that day was Thursday. He had, uh, the only thing he had not gained use of was his left arm at the time. He could not move it at all. But by Friday, he was already beginning to get use of his left arm and he is continuing to heal in the process. It was just, to me, a clear demonstration of God showing himself strong on behalf of those who will trust him, believe him to be the mighty God. Amen? So, Isaiah, empowered by the Holy Spirit, says to us today, where are you hurting? Where are you weak? Where are you in need? Where's the injustice? Where is the, the prayer that you've prayed and you're still waiting for an answer? Trust the mighty God. He will never forsake his people. He always does what is right and just because we have entered a covenant relationship with him to never leave us or forsake us, but to show himself strong. Amen? Would you bow your heads this morning? The Lord speaks this promise to us today that we might be filled with great hope and encouragement. That for whatever situation you're in today that has yet to see the resolve that you're praying for, he says to you, I am the mighty God in your midst. I will save. And while you wait, I am rejoicing over you with gladness. I am rejoicing over you with singing. Let that quiet you today. Let that draw you in close to his heart and hear his heartbeat for you. Father, I thank you that while we were in the most desperate of situations, you sent your son. And there the child would grow and become the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Though Mary could not have known the fullness of it, I thank you that you've shown it even through her to us and through your word to us. You will always be there to rescue your children, for you are the great I am. It's in whose name we pray. Amen.